Dear ladies and gentlemen, whether you are experts coming from abroad or from this country, actors in the f uh, freedom of uh, religion or belief field or form field that I will use from now on, um, or just with a special interest in the topic, dear friends, I wish you a good morning and a heartly welcome to Lysebu and this conference on politicization of freedom of religion or belief for better and worse. Together we are, with the help of experts in each of the topics at the program, going to explore and discuss a few aspects of politicization of form. We are delighted that so many of the invited speakers have ex accepted the invitation to contribute with their expertise to shed light on the topics in question. And a special welcome to uh, Professor Heine Bielefeld, who uh, has really been struggling to arrive to this conference, and we are, we are happy that you are here this morning. But what is the reason for the topic of the conference? Of course, there are many reasons. One of them, I would claim, is that it is out of experience working in, uh, in what I would call the Forb industry. Let me explain by the story of the Oslo Coalition. In August 1998, the International Conference on the Freedom of Religion or Belief was held in Oslo, not far from here. And uh, one of the hosts of the conference, uh, the then Bishop Gunnar Stoset, is with us today. He has been in the working group for this conference. And also, some of the participants also participated at the conference then in 1998. With reference to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and other instruments, as well as the 1981 Declaration on the Elimination of All Forms of Intolerance and Discrimination Based Upon Religion or Belief, the participants agreed to build an international coalition to develop a strategic plan of action to achieve substantial progress and give practical support to, the implem um, uh, to implement FORB. They urged the organizers and sponsors of the Oslo conference in consultation with conference participants to review the discussions and recommendations of the conference with the purpose of creating an Oslo coalition on freedom of religion or belief and to develop a strategic plan of action and seek funding to carry out programs and projects based upon its recommendations in cooperation with the United Nations system. The then Special Rapporteur on uh, Freedom of Religion and Belief, Abdul Fattah Amor, was there, and we have actually had the pleasure to cooperate with each Special Rapporteur um, uh, after them, and the last six years with Professor Bielefeld. <clears throat> so the start of the coalition, what happened after the conference? Um, the organizers of the conference in, uh, here in Oslo met, sat down and said, what do we do from here? And we will set up a secretariat, um, we will, um, and where should we situate it? And it was decided that we will, uh, we will um, apply to have it situated at the then uh, Norwegian Institute for Human Rights. And I think that was a very good solution because the owners of the Oslo Coalition were the, um, uh, were the Institute for Human Rights, uh, it was um, the International Council for Ecumenical and uh, in, uh, International, uh, International and Ecumenical Affairs, and it was the Cooperation Council for Religion and Lifestyle Societies. So it was a mixture of uh, academic-oriented and religious uh, practice oriented owner. And this is what also, m I think, made the Oslo Coalition unique. Um, and <clears throat> the purpose uh, to meet was also to develop a strategy. What were we going to do? What were we going to focus? And we had long discussions on, um, uh, on networking, um, monitoring, not monitoring, what kind of orientation were we going to have. And we decided that we are not going to monitor, that we have, we have very good monitoring mechanism uh, uh, on an international level, so that will not be our task. Our task 
was, would be to develop projects based upon um, new knowledge that we get from fact-finding missions and by uh, getting scholars coming together. And the approach um, was, this, uh, was uh, of course, a cross-disciplinary approach. Uh, jurists, humanists, um, theologians, uh, political scientists, uh, from uh, every orientation, were coming together and working together. And <clears throat> one of the, the very first projects we had would be that we're going to re review the papers that we presented at the Oslo conference. And it soon became clear that we, we wanted to develop some more than the papers presented. And the, um, the project on developing the book on facilitating freedom of religion or belief, a desk book, was born. And we had our very first um, meeting in, um, uh, in Hungary, in Budapest. And actually during that project, the acronym of FORB was born. Because as one of the editors, Bahia Tazibli, she said, it is so heavy to see freedom of religion or belief all the time. So we need to make it shorter. Let us say FORB. And now it has spread. So this actually was from one of the projects of the Oslo Coalition that you see now everywhere in the field. Um, we also uh, uh, were invited to, uh, to have an official delegation to visit China. And then one of the really features, I'm a little bit detailed now to explain how the Oslo Coalition thinks. One of the features was um, uh, that we had uh, six experts and a translator on China, an expert on China coming together and um, visit, um, uh, visit um, different institutions, religious uh, and state institutions, university institutions in China. And they were very surprised because we were not focusing specially on Christian Protestant churches. We asked questions wherever we came uh, on a religious practice. And I don't think that we used to have historians of religion and experts on the religion asking about daily practice and the small questions. And uh, the result of the, um, of the um, visit was also that we decided to focus on Buddhism, not on Protestant Christianity. I think it was a pleasant surprise for this, uh, the Chinese authorities. And we had a wonderful cooperation and dialogue and projects with China until, uh, until the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> <laughs> and then it became a little bit cooler, the atmosphere. <coughs> but we have established friendships um, uh, and contacts and people um, uh, that, that we would like to co cooperate further with when there will be a possibility. Um, New perspectives and partners that was not so obvious to work with would, would also be a priority of the Oslo Coalition. And uh, one of them would be to establish a platform for um, Muslim reformist thinkers on how to promote reform um, from within the Islamic tradition. Uh, they are, uh, this category of Muslim thinkers are actually under the radar. Because either people are, there is focus on conservatives or it's focus on those who don't like uh, Islam so much, or secular views. Uh, and uh, so this would actually be a, a, a new approach to, to Islamic thinking. And uh, we have set up nine workshops so far. Uh, we have uh, two publications. One of the publication is actually um, uh, to answer the question, are there possibilities for Islamic arguments for equality before the law? And the answer was yes. And we have shown the methodology, uh, come up with the main problem, uh, and so shown the methodology, and uh, it is now used as a curriculum <coughs> book in several universities. And we have also developed a report, or what we call the activist document, that can be downloaded from our website. And uh, with, with the gist of all the arguments. Uh, and what we see is that 
actually academia is a very important field when it uh, when it um, um, uh, it, it is about promoting uh, Ford in the long run because education is a key to, uh, uh, to, uh, to approach. It should not be an emotional approach, it should be a rational and knowledge-based uh, knowledge approach. Um, and that has also led us to another uh, project category that is Ford competence building. And we have been mainly working in Indonesia and setting up master level courses in Sharia and human rights. Um, and we have now just got uh, it uh, accepted as a regular part of the biggest um, Muhammadiyah University in Indonesia, um, uh, as a regular part of a master degree. Uh, and we are cooperating with um, the Gajamada University on a summer school that will also be fully integrated into the curriculum. Um, with regard to the methodology we have learned with the Muslim experts and scholars, uh, big topics in protected, protected small spaces, we have also established a, another project now with focus on the Christian Orthodox Church and um, uh, here at Lisebu, um, uh, distinguished scholars and theologians have met um, three times to discuss the relation of the uh, Christian Orthodox Church with the other. Uh, because we understood that it's, it is not enough to, to complain or to work from the minority's perspective. How do we improve the situation of the minority? Also by approaching the majority and learn how they are thinking and challenge them uh, uh, according to uh, human rights standards. Um, uh, this three workshop was so successful that they have now taken the initiative for new workshop on gender and sexuality um, in the Christian Orthodox Church. Uh, and uh, what we see from the first lab is that they're also bringing this back into circles within the church. So what more can we wish uh, from our small uh, entity that is the Oslo Coalition? What we also met in the Oslo Coalition is the challenge of missionary activities. It has been a sensitive issue since the very start of work with human declaration of, um, uh, of human rights. And the reason is not necessarily the fear or from the beginning was not necessarily fear of uh, conversion or prohibition against conversion. If you read the process behind the development of the Universal Declaration, I will quote an, uh, inaccurately um, the representative from Saudi Arabia, who was actually a Lebanese, Mr. Baroudi. He, he, was, he did not agree about the right to change religion in the Universal Declaration, and why? It was not because it was prohibited in Islam. He said, no, it is like a symbol of the colonial power. That is why we don't like it. So it is about weak and strong states as well. It is politics in the very um, purest sense. So we, have, we started then to work with, mis uh, with uh, to approaching missionary activities uh, and, uh, on a human rights perspective. And we hope that we would have some self-reflection on missionary activities. However, what was the result after a painful process? Because we're now approaching the, the very core of what freedom of religion or belief is about. It is, uh, we could agree upon ground rules, ethical rules of, uh, uh, of missionary activities. And actually, that has proved to be uh, a success, it is said internationally because it's not reasoned with one tradition, it is, it is based upon uh, international human rights standards. It, that is the basis for the document. But we then understood that this topic, it's really is a symbol of the politicization of freedom of religion or belief as a field. And how could we best promote FORB 
uh, as, a, uh, as a human right. Um, we have been thinking about this and to this conference that we hope will help us further to develop a strategy on best to promote freedom of religion or belief, we have, de we have developed a, dra a sacrificial draft uh, that we hope that the participants would comment and uh, come with, add, uh, with their inputs so we can develop it during the conference. And I will read um, uh, out the text that we have produced until now, bearing in mind that it should be short and that people should remember it. It is not a new declaration that is very long, very sophisticated, and that nobody, uh, nobody remembers except for one phrase. So, um, uh, so this is the sacrificial draft that I will read for you, we'll distribute, uh, and we are looking forward also to comments and input, so we can have a final document after, um, uh, at the end of this conference. And uh, this is also in the spirit of the Oslo Coalition. We work together, there is not one interest on uh, the cost of the other, it is a common uh, enterprise, enterprise um, that we are working for the common good for all. So, <clears throat> promotion of the right to freedom of religion or belief is controversial and encounter high barriers, not least because religion or belief have existential significance for humans. Religion or belief provides meaning to life and rules and norms of human actions. In this way, religion or belief give direction and purpose to our lives. From this perspective, it makes sense to promote the right to freedom of religion or belief from one, one's own faith perspective and commitments once other religions or re beliefs are not perceived as existentially threatening, but as our strange sisters and brothers. The growing importance of religion in politics is a trend in many countries in the world. The situation of form is more precarious than ever. This situation has consequences for both majorities and minorities and sets the tone for communication and on social, cultural and political discourse on issues concerning form making this basic human right hotly debated around the world. A religious political rhetoric based on we and them is increasingly being used as a political stratagem toward other faiths. We also see that extreme religious movements are often associated with literalism and conservative interpretations of religion. The following issues are particularly urgent to form. Freedom of speech, women's rights, and protection of minorities whose ethnicity and language are related to their religion. Fundamental principles such as non-discrimination and equality before the law are consistently set aside. Around 60 experts and actors in the field of form participated at the conference Politicization of Freedom of Religion or Belief for Better and Worse in Oslo, Norway in October 2016. The conference was hosted by the Oslo Coalition on Freedom of Religion or Belief in cooperation with the International Center for Law and Religious Studies, Brigham Young University. The participants <coughs> agreed upon the following guidelines for the promotion of freedom of religion or belief. And here is the sacrificial draft points. The human right to freedom of religion or belief protects a person or persons holding beliefs or convictions not religion or tradition as such. Forb is a common good for all, not any group's special interest at the cost of the other. The right to Forb includes the right to have an interpretation that differs from the dominating interpretation within a tradition. No religion or belief is a monolithic entity and the believer's understanding of their own tradition must be protected. The right to Forb is one human right among other human rights all of which are universal, indivisible, interdependent, and interrelated. The right to form should never be neglected, nor should it be overemphasized. Protection of the right to form depends on deep and thorough knowledge of the different beliefs and practices and of international human rights. A sound interdisciplinary approach and cooperation in the field is required. Monitoring and reporting on human suffering due to violations of neglect of form 
is not enough to improve the situation. The question of form is highly politicized. We encourage a critical approach and the will to reflect on declarations and other tools and agendas that claims to promote form. Thank you for your attention. And, and, and once more, welcome to Lisebu and the conference. And uh, I uh, welcome Professor Heine Bielefeld to deliver his keynote speech. Thank you very much. Anna. Do we, do we need this blue light? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I can um, do with it, but uh, I would actually prefer not to, to look as blue. <laughs> Excuse me, can I take the mic off? Uh, and uh, one in the pocket. Do you mind putting this in your pocket? Uh, do, I, do we need that? Well, I can't film if I don't. Ah, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. just put it in your Yeah. <coughs> so, good morning, everybody. <coughs> morning. Morning. <laughs> morning. Yeah. Um, I should be an ex rapporteur by now. Instead, I'm a zombie rapporteur. Somehow, I mean, the man that seems to be glued to me, okay, not for very long, but still, I am the acting rapporteur. Uh, I have to tell you, actually, I feel like a zombie today, uh, uh, because, I mean, uh, uh, Lena uh, kindly alluded to that in her remarks. I had a very complicated trip. Uh, the aircraft didn't work in Amsterdam, so there was a problem with the, with the, with the engines. So, and in the end, I only arrived just now. Uh, a few day, a few hours ago, and uh, so bear with me if I'm not my usual cheerful and charismatic <laughs> <laughs> self. <laughs> but um, um, nah, somehow the ashes, maybe there is a bird rising from the ashes, not the phoenix today, just a duck. <laughs> just a duck that can still open the mouth a bit. Yeah, let's see, let's see. So um, let me start with politicization. I've uh, wondered, I mean, what does it actually mean, politicization of FORB? I mean, certainly it does not mean that something previously non-political now has become more and more politicized. And you are shaking your head, of course. FORB has always been highly political, politically contested. Maybe, I mean, politicization, I mean, discussing that now, points to the experience that that political dimension has become more pronounced recently. Actually, I would agree. I mean, there's an increasing awareness, there's an increasing attention to FORB issues, motivated, um, I don't know by what, I mean, different, very different motivations underneath. Uh, and on the one hand, yes, we see also new commitment. We will also hear examples during the conference of new initiatives like the Interparliamentarian Platform that actually had their kick, uh, kick-off meeting in Oslo two years ago, uh, and other initiatives. So there is an increased attention, awareness uh, of how important FORB is. At the same time, there's also a lot of suspicion. Yeah? So, uh, freedom of religion or belief seems to be a complicated human right. Some people might even question the human rights nature of freedom of religion or belief. I mean, that was one of my biggest surprises. Um, and uh, it's complicated. Uh, people show an interest, and uh, the interest is on the rise, but there's also suspicion on the rise. Very much, I mean, connected to suspicion that people feel for religion in general, and then sometimes freedom of religion or belief seems to be the entry point within the human rights from, okay, let's put religion back. Of course, it's more complicated than that. Yeah? But I mean, that, that's why I mean, it sometimes uh, triggers uh, mixed feelings also within the human rights community. I mean, I just came across <laughs> this. I don't want to go into the substance. It's a brochure. Um, I, uh, drawing the line, tackling tensions, tensions between freedom, uh, between religious freedom and equality. Of course, there are tensions. What else would you expect? Of course, there are tensions. 
So tackling tangents, but drawing the line, okay, it's not actually my favorite motto, drawing the line. I'm always in favor of synergies. Let's see. Let's see where the lines are. Yeah? So sometimes they are not as clear as, think, uh, as many people might think. And then you see this, uh, religion equality. The problem is not that we have tangents. Okay, of course we have. But, I mean, what this picture suggests is they will never, ever meet. So the more you, you go down the way for freedom of religion, okay, you move away from equality. And if, vice versa, if you, will, if you really want to have a consistent equal, uh, equality policy, non-discrimination, anti-discrimination policy, okay, then freedom of religion is really not helpful. Maybe it's an obstacle. It points to the wrong direction. I mean, th this is, of course, the text is more sophisticated than the than this picture on the title. Uh, but nonetheless, I mean, that is pretty telling. And I mean, the only reason why I'm showing this is I have seen that type of mindset very, very often. Yeah? Uh, so, I mean, there, there is interest, political interest. There's also anxiety, skepticism. Certainly, we see an increased awareness of the, the political dimension of freedom of religion or belief. In that sense, we can actually say, yes, politicization. But it has always been political. And Lena already uh, 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 also pointed to that reality. Why has it been political? The answers are very easy. Uh, on the one hand, four challenges. On the other hand, Forp is being challenged. And I will spend most of my time on this. But in order to be able to do that, let me at least dwell a few minutes on why Forp is a pretty challenging right, a provocative right. As I said in, in a conference in Brigham Young, I mean, there the focus was on this dimension. Now I will actually focus on the flip side. But very briefly, I mean, OK. I can be brief because you know it anyway. I'm not telling you anything that you are not fully aware of. But of course, FORP challenges religious hegemonies. It opens up societies for pluralism, diversity, existing diversity, emerging diversity, also in the public sphere. OK, we know it all. Uh, FORP undermines questions the legitimacy of privileging particular religions, having official religions, something also currently felt in Norway. Yeah? yeah? Okay, thank you very much, Dora. For <laughs> there was already a comment, yeah? Yeah, uh, so uh, because like other human rights, I mean, the equality dimension is also part of FORP, which is another reason why this picture somehow doesn't capture it, yeah? I mean, uh, equality of dignity, equality of rights. It's, a, it's one of the pillars of the human rights framework. Yeah? So freedom of religion, of course. I mean, it also has that non-discrimination component must be implemented in a non-discriminatory fashion. And whenever a state singles out a particular religion for special treatment, at least serious questions must be raised. For challenges, in general, the role of the state as uh, custodians of, and now hmm, sometimes of truth claims, sometimes of purity claims, uh, but even under the auspices of very secular regimes, very often the state sees itself as the guardian of national identity with religion being an ingredient of national identity, of national cohesion. So I mean that sort of state activities, putting religion under its wing promoting, protecting, curtailing, using, abusing, instrumentalizing, and all this, which happens under the auspices of all religions, but also secular regimes. Yeah? Again, it's questioned through FORP. Then FORP is also in the way of control policies, of control obsessions. And I mean, the rule of the thumb is the more authoritarian a government is, the more control obsessed it will be. And that also includes hmm, nervousness, yeah, freedom of religion, I believe. Uh, people meet. Hmm. They meet. On, in, I mean, that's the idea. Uh, and they take initiatives. Yeah? Religion is something very social. 
It's community driven. Uh, and uh, especially governments with a party monopoly, I mean, they always have to work on the illusion that there's a seamless identity between the party and the people. And once people start to talk, to assemble, to meet, and who knows what they will come up with, that may already amount to an implicit challenge of the party monopoly in countries like China, Vietnam, etc. That's, I mean, uh, don't underestimate how challenging, how provocative for this. Also for authoritarian governments across the various ideological auspices under which they may operate. Yeah, but then also for provokes religious communities in a positive way. So I'm Catholic, as you all know. I mean, the Catholic Church, before the Second Vatican Council, had enormous problems with human rights in general and with freedom of religion in particular. It was actually condemned. And Lena also uh, mentioned some project that you have also with uh, Islamic universities. I mean, and the reason is it's still underway. Yes, that, and uh, also in the Catholic Church, I mean, the Second uh, Vatican Council was a breakthrough, but I mean, of course, not solving all the issues. Yeah? So also, I mean, for religious communities, now for claiming everyone has rights here, and human beings are the right holders, yeah? I mean, there is an element of challenge to which then religious communities react in very different ways, positive, skeptical, sometimes even condemning, uh, freedom of religion, which still ex uh, happens also today. But then also uh, for poses a challenge to liberal societies, Western societies, because, I mean, it makes liberal societies and especially the liberal milieus in liberal societies aware of deep diversity, a diversity that goes beyond the idiosyncrasies that you take for granted in liberal milieus. So, and it's important not to uh, equate liberality or freedom just with a certain urban, ironic, detached lifestyle. Yeah? So it's very important. But you see, I mean, there is uh, a lot of provo provocation. It confronts secular society, secular institutions with the ambiguities of secularity. I will come back to that in a few minutes. And it certainly does add an element of complication also to non-discrimination agendas. Not like this. They never meet. I mean, this is what the, what the picture seems to signal, seems to indicate. I mean, this is wrong. But certainly, I mean, sometimes when freedom of religion enters the picture of religion, religious components of discrimination, okay, things will become more complex. Uh, it's not like this, uh, that these will never meet, but sometimes you will have to make a little detour. Yeah, but maybe sometimes it's also good to do a little detour to take more people on board for non-discrimination agendas. I think freedom of religion or belief has a positive role to play. Not, I would not say it's all the same thing. It's always pointing in the same direction. The detours may be, they are part of complications that finally, it sounds trivial, maybe it is trivial, but sometimes we have to remind ourselves of these truisms. Human beings are complicated beings. Yeah? So, I mean, the easy ways, the easy policies are not the sustainable ones. So maybe we have to, sometimes we have to go the extra mile. Yeah? Nonetheless, it's not really pointing in irreconcilably different directions, but it adds an element of complications. And therefore, I mean, freedom of religion or belief also poses challenges within the human rights framework, within the human rights community. If you work on freedom of religion or belief, especially in a more exposed position, you have to expect friendly fire. One of the biggest surprises for me was how unfriendly the friendly fire can be. Yeah, so yeah, so uh, also from within the office of the High Commissioner, my goodness. And I mean, I, I, I read the, the Oslo Declaration once again, and here, I mean, it sounds a bit utopian, if I may quote the Oslo uh, Declaration, uh, I mean, here, Oslo, requests that the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights develops a coordinated plan to focus on resources, blah, 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 specialized agencies, bodies like UNESCO, ILO, UNDP, UNHCR. I, yeah, and I would be happy if in, within the office of the High Commissioner this would work out. Yeah? It, okay, it, sometimes it does. Yeah? So I, I should not be too critical, but... Certainly, we cannot take that for granted. Yeah? So, I mean, there, there are real challenges. 
there are real challenges. And now let me turn, this is not my main chapter, actually the second last slide. Yeah, so for being challenged. Uh, uh, for being challenged, um, and uh, here I will just run through a number of examples. I mean, maybe that can also count as politicization. I'm not entirely sure, but maybe at least some of that. So, I mean, because FORP itself is so challenging, naturally, we should, we should not complain too much about it's also being challenged in various ways. And uh, by governments, by civil society actors, by religious communities, also in academic discussions, more and more. Just a few examples. Now, governments, because some of them, actually many of them, find um, for problematic, never admitting that. I mean, what you usually uh, hear when you do a country visit is, no problems, which is the most suspicious word you can ever encounter. No problem. Okay, there you will be in trouble. I mean, yeah, yeah because it is challenging. Yeah. So, but this creates an incentive for many governments to, ren to then put FOB under control. Put FOB under control, and one way of doing that is requesting prior registration. So turning a human right into, I don't know, uh, uh, an element of mutual agreements. You get permissions on the condition that you are loyal, yeah, in exchange for loyalty requesting all sorts of loyalty declarations, administrative procedures, uh, okay, administrative procedures that are mandatory for even exercising basic functions of freedom of religion. Yeah? So, and uh, in violation of what the Oslo Declaration, let me quote it again, because that's part of the task I've taken, what the Oslo Coalition, uh, in very beautiful words, uh, points out, and that is referring to the uh, UDHR, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the world community recognized for the first time that the existence of human rights transcends the laws of sovereign states. It transcends the laws of sovereign states. You can also replace transcends by it precedes it. Yeah? I mean, that's the assumption. And strangely, I mean, many states do the opposite. You can get it in exchange for, okay, let's see how loyal you are. And um, I mean, many of these administrative procedures, which are one of the main obstacles for the full exercise of freedom of religion, or sometimes for any exercise, uh, they even uh, uh, run under the title of recognition. So you can exercise your freedom of religion provided your religious community is recognized. And I mean, this is really perverse. Sorry for being a bit outspoken. Because, I mean, recognition is actually the first word of the UDHR. But recognition in terms of a basic insight. So, I mean, all human rights are respected on the understanding, on that assumption, yes, human dignity, inherent. So the first words of the UDHR, the first words of the preamble of the, of the first ever international human rights document is recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable, in, in, inalienable rights of all members of the human family. So recognition, inherent dignity, inalienable rights, all human beings, all members of the human being, recognition, but recognition not as a, as a result of negotiation processes or something that you get, I mean, with the rubber stamp of the administration. Now we have the recognition. No, this is the starting point. It's the axiomatic starting point upon which the whole system of human rights is based. Yeah? So we always have to assume that. Only on the basis of that assumption, human rights make any sense. Otherwise, I mean, actually, you remove the human rights components of human rights, turning them into a negotiation product uh, or the product of certain administrative approval procedures that we can also withhold because the state is the one dictating, setting the conditions. I mean, that really goes against the human rights philosophy as formulated in the Oslo Declaration, really transcends, human rights transcends sovereign state and the positive law. And uh, realities, unfortunately, very often are different. Okay, 
A second example, now I'm just running through examples, a certain typology of how states try to push back freedom of religion or push back that challenge, yeah, keeping it in check, uh, goes through limitation clauses. And I don't know whether you have uh, uh, done that exercise. I mean, I very often looked, I often saw misquotes of the limitation clause. Uh, Article 18, paragraph 3 of the International Covenant. I don't want to go into details here, into technicalities. Uh, very often, I found that the most important word is totally missing in these quotes, maybe innocently missing. And the most important word is only. Yeah, it's very small. Yeah, so some, it, it, I mean, it, I, surprisingly often, even in official documents. Now that I know this is televised, I'm not giving you examples of official documents. I could, yeah. Even in official or semi-official documents, it's missing. Yeah, so thereby conveying the impression, okay, here you have a right and here you have a limitation. Okay, you have rights, here you have order. And then you start balancing. Actually, balancing is, for me, a suspicious word. It always makes me very, very nervous. I mean, this is the key word of, of relativism. Um, balancing. Limitation clauses are not about balancing. I mean, what is human rights if you can start balancing processes? Yeah? So here you have a right, which is nice to have. And here you have public order interests, which are, of course, very important. And then you have the weighing scales. And let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. And the more important, the more urgent uh, uh, security, public health, public order interests are supposed to be. I mean, then, OK, freedom of religion becomes totally dependent. Yeah? So it loses its weight. It's totally dependent on that. So what's the status of that any longer? And that's why, I mean, really be very careful whenever you see the word balancing. It's fashionable. I mean, you see it all over the place. Sometimes maybe we cannot avoid using it. I use it from time to time, but be cautious. Be cautious. I mean, it's, it's, at least this cannot be the headline to make sense of limitation clauses. Because then it's actually, instead of, I mean, then the limitation clauses become the entry point of all sorts of trade offs. You actually sell out the substance when. Um, when uh, 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 seeing, when, when interpreting limitation clauses in that language, in that metaphor of balancing, 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 it's trade offs. And this is happening, sometimes rather innocently. But also look at the law commentaries, it's all about balancing. Yeah? Instead, I think we have to replace the balancing metaphor, be very cautious with that. We have to replace it by a justification logic. And the justification logic is really a different logic because it means, okay, the starting point is freedom of religion or belief in recognition of the inherent dignity. That's the starting point. That's the rule. And of course, life is complicated. Yeah, we know it. Sometimes maybe there is a need for setting certain limitations. But then, okay, the onus of justification, the burden of justification is on those and must remain on those who deem limitations necessary. So the logic is only if and only if and only if and only if. There are, is a cumulative only if logic and I don't want to go into the technicalities. But uh, if, you, if you take that logic seriously, then it means freedom of religion or belief, and the same applies also to freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, other rights. Is the, the starting point, this is the rule, and exceptions always require the extra justification according to certain criteria. It's not the loose balancing. And here, I mean, with is this I would actually say it, because I mean it, it's the most dangerous entry point for relativism, for selling out the substance of human rights, balancing. If you replace, if you really stick to a justification logic, uh, uh, you must be aware justification presupposes an addressee towards which justification is done. So, I mean, the persons affected by certain limitations are the addressees, at least in a virtual communication, which also means uh, there are absolute red lines. Where no infringements, no restrictions, no limitations can ever be justified. 
So because, for instance, by brainwashing a person, you remove the addressee of justifications, which is the reason why the forum internum protection of freedom of religion or belief is absolute. Yeah. It's necessary. I mean, there's a logic underneath, and this is not as some people want us to believe, because there is a Protestant bias in freedom of religion or belief, which only privi we always privilege the inner dimension. No, this is wrong. It does not privilege the inner dimension. All dimensions are equally important. But the justification of limitations requires respecting the person, not brainwashing the person, also not torturing the person, not enslaving the person. We have the same logic in the absolute prohibition of torture, the absolute prohibition of slavery, because you would remove the addressee of justification. Yeah? And here also, that's why it's not privileging the inner dimension, the Protestant bias. I mean, this is really superficial stuff. Yeah? Lots of misunderstandings in the discussion. Uh, uh, there's a logic. So I would really see that in parallel to the uh, prohibition of torture, which is not the Fordham Internum, by the way. Um, uh, so, uh, so much about the balancing. Then another, a third example, a, a third example is, you can call it the spatialization of form. Not specialization, the spatialization. So uh, territorializing form somehow. By, okay, designing certain spaces where, okay, it can be exercised with the boundaries usually remaining a bit unclear. Let me give you an example. I, when, uh, when I was in Kazakhstan, uh, we visited a school in Almaty, the, the, the old capital, and uh, uh, we had to talk, uh, talk with a, a number of teachers who also give a little bit of religious in, uh, education, very, very tiny bits. And so I asked a question, really innocent, I didn't want to embarrass anyone, because I saw a mosque in the vicinity of the, of, of the school and also a church nearby. I saw my innocent question, really out of curiosity, was do you sometimes visit the church or the mosque with your school children? And the teachers reacted very, I mean, shocked. Said, no, this is a secular school. Just imagine what that means. This is a secular school. Yeah, an understanding of secularism, okay, which is hermetic. I mean, this is a space where religion cannot become visible. I mean, you, 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 yeah. Uh, again, in Kazakhstan, when talking uh, with uh, um, a, a leading figure of Islamic, of, of the Islamic umbrella organization, I asked the same question about chaplains in the army. And again, I mean, the, the, the answer was, I mean, we have a secular army. Yeah, secular army, okay. The secular institutions are hermetic, no religion. And so uh, all the state institutions are secular, schools, the army, and maybe there's something in between, yeah? So it's all secular in the sense of being closed to religion. Yeah? So, I mean, here what remains for religion is the predefined, the demarcated spaces, where you can have worship. Actually, you never know exactly where the boundaries are, so be careful. And of course, the private sphere. No one cares too much about the private sphere. So it's really pushed into a private issue. Freedom of religion or belief is pushed into a private sphere, into a private space. And uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I already alluded to the ambiguities of secularity or secularism, and uh, also in the West, also in this part of the world, uh, in Western Northern Europe, uh, I think we very often confuse openness with emptiness. I mean, the secular space should be an open space. And the state is in charge of keeping it open, against collapsing it from outside or from inside, I mean, which requires a lot of active investments. It means it requires doing for it not letting it happen. It also requires active investments in terms of education, media work, outreach, uh, awareness raising, etc., etc. So uh, secularity as an, a space providing principle, open space, but a space that can also be filled with voices. Yeah? Sometimes a noisy space. But instead, I mean, the misunderstanding is openness is mistaken for emptiness, an empty space. 
an empty space where then uh, secularity becomes, or secularism, I don't even I make, I don't make that distinction now. Cole sometimes makes it, I sometimes also made it secularity, but I mean, we have to clarify it anyway, yeah? And, and very often I mean, we see a lot of confusion uh, there and uh, also in Europe. My second last example uh, is um, turning, I mean, pushing freedom of religion or belief back by turning it into collective identity protection at the expense of actually the freedom component. Uh, collective identity. I, by the way, I mean, the collective dimension is fine. Yeah? So uh, my understanding of FORP is this is not just an, something focusing on the individual. No, the community dimension is not a second layer. It's really important. It's really important. Community, institutional frameworks, yeah. But identity, I mean, that's what really makes me nervous. Human rights cannot protect identities. There's no right to identity, but it's always the right to free articulation of identities. So, I mean, don't forget the, the F within FORP. Freedom of religious belief. So the free articulation, which also means um, uh, possibly a freely changing articulation, and change, uh, again, um, Lena mentioned that already in her talk, uh, when also alluding to that story where the, the Saudi representative in the UDHR had his critical remarks. Change is the test case. Freedom to change. Freedom to change, not that this is easy. Yeah? Uh, but authentic religious practice implies the possibility for persons yeah, to talk, to think, to come up also with questions, to express doubts, sometimes also drawing the consequences, abandoning uh, a faith or a belief system, a church or uh, another religious community, which usually is complicated. I mean, that very often goes hand in hand with a personal crisis, but this is the test case, the possibility, because even remaining in your traditional religious community would not be an expression of freedom unless at least there was a possibility to reconsider, to change. And uh, I mean, collective identity, okay, that, that, that is some, sometimes then a problem, if, especially if then religion is seen in analogy to ethnic characteristics. And we, I mean, there is one version of the politicization of religion is the, can you say that, ethnicization of religion, where, by, whereby religion is really portrayed as something analogous to ethnic characteristics. And uh, sometimes when reading also human rights commentaries on ethnicity, you see it, immutable personal characteristics, immutable characteristics that bind you together with other members of the same group, immutable. So where then the element of change becomes very questionable. Can you change your ethnic characteristics? Some people might say yes. Okay, maybe may it's difficult. But certainly, I mean, what would be not possible is to induce someone else to change their ethnic characteristic, and, but this is part of freedom of religion and belief, a very controversial part, again, Lena said it already, missionary activities, or let's use maybe the, the, the term bearing witness, speaking about one's faith, inviting others, I mean, that's part of it. Uh, so conversion in the double sense, I convert, but maybe I can even convert someone else, of course, non-coercively, they they, we have also to, to, to keep certain conditions in mind here, but this has always been the most controversial part. And uh, actually, when I produced a report on that in the General Assembly to the Third Committee of the General Assembly four years ago, that was an ice-cold reception that I received. Ice-cold. Yeah. Uh, it was actually the, the most, most hostile experience in, in any of these so-called interactive dialogues with states. Conversion. You, I, I could feel it. I mean, it's highly controversial. But without that possibility of changing of reconsidering, I mean, freedom of religion or belief would not be freedom. It would be something else. It would be the protection of given identities. And actually, uh, if, you, if you look a bit cl more closely at the rhetoric, sometimes it's exactly what you feel people have in mind. So, for instance, the Alliance of Civilization, I don't know whether any of you had the pleasure to attend meetings of the Alliance of, uh, of, of Civilizations. <laughs> not, okay, you haven't missed much. <laughs> Sorry, you haven't missed much. Uh, because, I mean, there is a strange mafia rhetoric. Uh, it's the mafia rhetoric of dividing influence zones. With the nice wording of respect, 
We respect each other. We respect each other. But I've always wondered, I mean, how inclusive is the we? Uh, Baha'is are usually not invited to the Alliance of Civilizations, for instance. I mean, how inclusive is the we? Yeah? And then, I mean, respect often, it's, it's, it sounds like, okay, don't touch us. This is our influence zone. Yeah? This is our flock that we take our, uh, uh, under our wing. It's so if, it's not only lacking in inclusivity, but also there's a certain authoritarian undertone. Yeah? And here we have to be very clear uh, that this has nothing to do with freedom of religion or belief. Yeah? So sometimes, again, I mean, people can confuse this. Yeah? Because, okay, there's a nice rhetoric of tolerance, okay. but these are different concepts of interreligious harmony. And there, okay, I sometimes like harmony, but freedom of religion or belief, as I would insist, I know uh, John likes that, <laughs> uh, is a not too harmonious peace project. It's peace, but not silent peace. It's a noisy peace. Yeah. Only then it's also authentic peace. It's a noisy piece, not too harmonious. And so as uh, human rights people, we have also always to have a soft spot for the troublemakers. Yeah, of course, peaceful troublemakers, non-coercive, non-violent troublemakers, dissidents, converts, those blurring the lines, uh, refusing that identity talks, getting out of the boxes, the various boxes. I mean, the troublemakers, the peaceful troublemakers, they never fit. Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons sometimes, yeah? Baha'is, oh, uh, yeah, troublemakers, you wouldn't even consider they are troublemakers, but from a certain viewpoint, they are. They are. So, and they, usually they don't really uh, have, a, have, a, have, a, have a place in those meetings, yeah, which makes this highly problematic. So my last example, before I then really come also to the conclusion is, my last example, um, where now FORP is being challenged, it's in a, a new wave of critical literature, that declares for to be outright impossible. Um, actually, I like criticism. We need criticism. Also, we need, sometimes we need harsh criticism. I'm also harshly criticizing. Um, uh, and uh, uh, human rights, as you all know, it's easier said than done. But already at the conceptual level, when spelling it out, you see difficulties. I mean, how to consistently spell out universalism, consistently. The honest answer is, don't be too sure. Maybe we have to do it. I believe we have to be universalists. We cannot afford, I mean, being stuck in our particularities and with, with no way of really communicating. But it's easier said than done. It's easier said than conceptualized consistently. It's not only the implementation issue, but even the conceptualization. I mean, if you take that seriously, you will always see blind spots, biases. And the problem with biases is you can only overcome once you have spotted them. Yeah? In retrospect, it's clear, yeah? but only in retrospect. Yeah? So we don't, no one can say I'm beyond biases. And that's why universalism, pure and simple, maybe it exists in mathematics. I'm not even sure about that. Certainly not in human rights politics. Yeah? So, I mean, yeah. And that's why I mean, the, the, the critical objections really are helpful. Also, critical objections to four practices. But, uh, I mean, the new wave of uh, supercritical literature epitomized by uh, Winifred Fallas Sullivan, I mean, the title is, she means it, impossibility of religious freedom. She means it. It's not only, I think, a, a little bit beefed up for, for marketing, but I think she means it. Or Elizabeth Shackman Hurth, beyond religious freedom. Uh, uh, I mean, this is not only radical, but it's actually very superficial. So, and that, uh, uh, that uh, combination of a very su uh, supercilious tone, ironic tone, in which then people talk about the gospel of religious freedom or a religious freedom crusade even, unmasking all sorts of hidden agenda, but not even trying to understand what the purpose of freedom of religion or belief. And that freedom of religion or belief follows the human rights approach. So for instance, Sullivan, she says, I mean, the problem with freedom, uh, why it's all impossible, outright impossible, uh, is freedom of religion or belief has to distinguish between uh, religion that is worthy of protection and religion unworthy of protection. So from the very beginning, it's selective. Yeah? Good religion, bad religion. <laughs> I mean, the point is freedom of religion or belief does not even deal with religion directly. 
I mean, of course, it relates to religion, but always indirectly through human beings. So it's an empowerment right uh, entitling human beings. So the idea, and it's complicated enough, and of course, also, it has implications for religion. It's not innocent. It's not easy. But uh, the idea is, let's uh, establish some order that gives breathing space to everyone. And also, I mean, the, the, it's an order that also remains adaptable because, uh, I mean, it's all based on free articulation of people who have to say what they are. And for some people, it's maybe even complicated to even freely articulate what they are. Maybe Protestants are more educated than members of indigenous religions. So, I mean, there are really, there is a lot we have to, uh, to discuss, also critically, self-critically discuss. But uh, what is actually missing in that uh, wave of literature, by and large, of course, uh, especially, I mean, the two persons that I, that I mentioned, who are the leading persons, uh, Sullivan and Hurd, even the slightest attempt to understand that freedom of religion or belief follows the human rights approach. Yeah? So this is totally missing. Though That's why also the criticism is radical, but only in the tone not really getting to the substance. There's not much radicalism because, I mean, it would require going to the roots and, I mean, it really misses the point entirely. And, uh, I mean, thereby also not uh, exercising also a, a sort of critical support to that never-ending exercise of developing a consistent policy of FORP, but it actually it undermines the very legitimacy of that effort, which actually annoys me, to be very clear. Um, to conclude, I think that, the, uh, and Lena encouraged me to talk a little bit about, about the Oslo Declaration, I think it's still very topical, in parts even utopian, we are far from that, especially, I mean, the various UN agencies cooperating, okay, when reading that again, I was smiling, <laughs> nice idea, uh, but, uh, 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 I mean, certainly, I, I would subscribe to the call to set up educational programs. And uh, I think uh, the target group of educational programs is actually ourselves. So we have to educate ourselves and, of course, others. But really uh, be aware, what is it really that we are doing when trying to make sense of this rather interesting, fascinating, right, but also complicated, right, freedom of religion or belief. Uh, so, I mean, this is really a remaining task. We have to educate ourselves to create clarity, more clarity, because, I mean, I don't know whether there's any field in human rights where you see so much confusion, so much confusion. Even people not seeing that human rights has, uh, that freedom of religion has anything to do with human rights. I mean, when in Germany we had the, the rather aggressive circumcision discussion four years ago, I, I did lots of interviews, and it's not a joke, but actually my f the first question usually was, what should prevail, human rights or religious freedom? So the assumption being, okay, human rights is something humanistic, so not religious, and then religious, and so it's about humanism and religion somehow. Uh, we have human rights and we have post-trans-human rights, not really fitting together. What should prevail? So, and, uh, and that's why, I mean, I think that the educational projects targeting others but also targeting ourselves have to be very elementary. And uh, the most elementary message, which also in retrospect now after more than six years working as mandate holder, it was not planned, but what I've always said is two things, actually you can say two coins of one at the same basic principle, freedom of religion or belief follows the human rights approach entirely. That's one side of the message. So it's universalistic. It's not clientelistic. It's not as narrow as some people think, only uh, privileging a certain group of people, the homo religiosos, the members of traditional religions only. It's about the identity shaping existential profound convictions and practices. Also the sense of belonging, the practices connected to that. Broadly speaking, but freely articulated. So it's very broad. Uh, like the human rights approach in general, all human beings should benefit from these rights. Also all human beings should benefit from folk. It's a right to freedom, so empowering human beings, empowering human beings um, uh, to stand up for their practices, for, yeah, to, to, to develop it, to further develop it, uh, to, to, to claim the space that they need, not only breathing space, but also moving space. 
Uh, and then uh, freedom, you cannot have freedom without equality. Yeah, so it's equal freedom for everyone, which is the reason why, I mean, freedom of religion, I believe, it belongs to that equality project. It's an inherent part, of course, as I said, sometimes adding elements of complication, but human life is complicated. Yeah? And uh, uh, so, I mean, all the, uh, the, the, the basic principles of human rights are fully present in freedom of religion, it would not make sense otherwise. Yeah? So freedom of religion will be fully follows the human rights approach, that's the one message. And then the same message somehow turned around is, without freedom of religion, I believe, the human rights approach would be incomplete. That's a mild way of putting it. It's too mild a way of putting it. It cannot do justice to human beings. Human beings, many of whom would really claim yeah, respect also for their convictions, but also for their practices, for the sense of belonging that is connected with that. I mean, without having that dimension of human life fully in mind, the whole business of human rights would cease to make any sense, because it then would not be doing justice to human beings. That's why we need it. Thank you very much. Ah, there's a speaking apparatus, yeah, for, yes, indeed, yeah. No, this is my mobile.